Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Companies Act, Chapter 8101, to make provision for the role of the Chief State Solicitor as the official receiver be now read a second time. Mr. Vice President, the bill before us is a very short one um, indeed. It is all of five clauses long, the first of which is the short title, being that this act may be cited as the Companies Amendment Act 2022. The second clause is that the act means the Companies Act. It is the interpretation section. The third proposes the insertion of a definition of official receiver. Quite simply put, in that context, into section four of the Parent Act, that is the Companies Act, to mean the Chief State Solicitor. The fourth clause is to repeal the provision in section 366 of the Companies Act, and the last clause is to repeal subparagraph 4 of section 462 of the Act. Permit me, therefore, in this short bill to explain exactly what we're doing, what brought us here, and what this debate involves. Quite frankly, Mr. Vice President, this is a very narrow debate on two simple points. In 2019, Mr. Vice President, we birthed a particular piece of law, and that is Act Number 6 of 2019. In that, we proposed an amendment to the Companies Act. In the sections of that particular Act, we dealt with a very important series of clarifications required for the Financial Action Task Force and for Global Forum and the European Union purposes. We introduced the prohibition against bearer share instruments. We introduced beneficial ownership across the realm. We introduced um, be, um, beneficial ownership and bearer share prohibitions in external companies as well. Importantly, in introducing, in introducing beneficial ownership, we were dealing with the scourge against money laundering, and in particular, we were unveiling equitable ownership. That is, people that really owned a share in a company or the value of companies, whilst they were not described as the legal owners, they were entitled to be called the beneficial owners. In Section 10 of that 2019 Act, we caused an amendment to Section 462 of the Companies Act. Now, Section 462 of the Companies Act is a specific provision which deals with that aspect of law where assets of a company are left over. Section 462 says where after a company has been dissolved, there remains any outstanding property, real or personal, etc., that that becomes vested in the official receiver. And therefore, in section 463, we put in for the purposes of, sorry, in section 462, subparagraph 4, we introduced a definition which said, for the purposes of this section, that is section 462, and for 463, the official receiver shall be the chief state solicitor. Understanding that amendment, we were focused upon recommendations then coming from the Financial Action Task Force. I'll remind that Trinidad and Tobago was undergoing its fifth round mutual evaluation, and we were scheduled at the CFATF table and at the FATF table to have an on-site examination in January 2020. These amendments were considered appropriate, and we graduated with flying colors out of the FATF fifth round on-site evaluation, as a result of which Trinidad and Tobago was taken off of the gray list, and we were put into regular reporting at CFATF. The purpose there in treating with a very targeted definition of official receiver confined to section 462 and section 463 was to ensure that companies which are struck off the register for whatever matter or whatever position of dissolution happens, that they could go, their assets could go to the official receiver. Now, Mr. Vice President, I should tell you 
that there are 89,544 companies on the register of companies. There are 9,315 non-profit companies on top of that. There are 593 external companies beyond that. And there are 11,705 registered non-profit organizations. Again, something which we introduced in 2019. It gives us a total of approximately 176,769 companies. And of that number, near 30,000 of those companies are liable to be struck off. And therefore, it was important in causing the amendments in 2019 to Section 462 that we birth the official receiver as the chief state solicitor. The chief state solicitor is a chief legal officer reflected upon in the Constitution as a chief legal officer. One of the functions of the chief state solicitor is to manage um, dissolutions, insolvencies, winding up, etc., apart from the civil law functions in, ass in assisting the Solicitor General's department, preparation of leases, the financial side of the equation. Today, Mr. Vice President, I give notice that the government has been going through the Companies Act. There are a series of amendments that we have yet to bring, largely upon the biggest package will be, number one, on the operationalization of the computer registration online system, referred to as CROSS. So I'm giving notice that Attorney General will advance that legislation, which we have already prepared. That legislation is to abandon all paper filings at the company's registry. In conducting that exercise for digital online services with full online filing, leaving behind paper filing, which is imminent, we discovered the lacuna in the legislation as it relates to the definition that we applied for the official receiver. Now, Mr. Vice President, the second side of this equation and the rationale for this bill comes because in 2014, there was a partial proclamation of a particular law. It's referred to as the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act 2006. It was partially proclaimed in 2014. Part 11 of that act was not proclaimed and still is not proclaimed. That relates to international um, insolvency issues. But when we cross-checked the amendments that we're doing, we realized that it was by far more appropriate in the definition section of the act, that is section four of the parent law, to include a definition of official receiver. We therefore propose in clauses um, three, four, and five, to harmonize official receiver as a definition, meaning the chief state solicitor, move it out of the sectional definitions found at section 462, repeal section 366, and section 366, again, related to a sectional definition. Section 366 of the parent law is, in the marginal note, described as meaning of official receiver, and it says for the purposes of this act, official receiver means the official receiver attached to the court for bankruptcy purposes and includes an assistant official receiver. Now, even though section 366 says that the definition is for the purposes of the act, architecturally from a drafting perspective, the advice is that we ought to put the definition of official receiver into section four of the parent law, which is where the definition applies for the full act. And in looking at section 366, in light of the proclamation in 2014 of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, it is prudent at this point, bearing in mind the allocation of state resources, that we include a definition of official receiver to mean the chief state solicitor because the official receiver only comes up, Mr. Vice, Mr. Vice President, when the official receiver is selected. I want to remind that the court in any proceeding still has the latitude to appoint any other person as the legislation may set out, but this is for the purposes of official receiver, number one, in the context of section 462, to receive assets from companies that are struck off so that there's an orderly, distribution of assets 
bearing in mind that a company can bring itself back onto the register within 20 years of being struck off. Number two, in a very narrow sense, to ensure that the official receiver means the chief state solicitor, because section 366, when it was drafted, the Companies Act is an act of 1995, that is chapter 8101, in 2008, when the bankruptcy and insolvency legislation came about, they let the, the definition changed away from what the definition used to be in the repealed law, which was the 1916 law. The 1916 law is um, the Bankruptcy Act of 1916, and what you see in Section 366 of the Act is, in effect, a regurgitation in different way of Section 73.1 of the 1916 law. So we have had an opportunity to tidy up the approach. This exercise came about as we are preparing for more significant amendments to the Companies Act to abandon paper and to move to full online systems. What I can say with relation, in relation to that is that the CROS system has been tested for nearly two years now so the system is entirely built out, and we're ready to launch those reforms. The last piece of, um, of positioning that will come about... Yes, please. Um, Attorney General, could you clarify for us? Are you suggesting that there will be further amendments being circulated as it relates to the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act to make it very clear who is the receiver and who is not the receiver? Th thank you. Is that going to be circulated? No, no, sir. If I may clarify, thank you for your question, Senator Mark. I was giving, in my usual way, a heads up that the Companies Act has further amendments, number one, to take care of digital transformation, and number two, from the Global Forum, in answer to Senator Sipasar, I indicated a little while ago that the Global Forum EU package has some amendments to the Companies Act to go. So I'm just giving a... a Courtesy heads up that there are two further amendments to the Companies Act. In preparing for those things, we noticed the definitional um, constraint because we were looking at how assets are to be managed um, when a company is struck off. That's section 462, and we spotted the opportunity to do this. This, this bill, if I state it quite simply, is one which we would normally do after a long day sitting where we do a short debate. Obviously, um, this is not to curtail any of the contributions of honorable senators, but it really is quite simple uh, amendment in scope. And there are, for the, in answer to Senator Mark's question, there are no proposed circulations to the bankruptcy and insolvency by way of consequential amendments because it doesn't need to be amended. What happened was there was a conflict between the 1916 Bankruptcy Act, when it was repealed by the 2008 Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, and upon proclamation in 2014, um, it was just simply missed in the proclamation. So back in 2014, the double-checking of the Companies Act um, was not an exercise which picked up a need for a consequential amendment, but in the work that we're doing, the EU and Global Forum and FATF, we noticed the definitional fix. I was giving an, a, an explanation as to why in 2019, we amended section 462 to put it in the section. And that was because at the time when we were dealing with the strikeout, the FATF was concerned, okay, if you've struck off a company, who is going to manage the return of the assets in the circumstances where it may happen? And that is on striking off applications or dissolution, not necessarily bankruptcy or insolvency. So, Mr. Vice President, that's the rationale for the legislation. I thank the Honorable Senate for the opportunity to give a very short contribution today. Um, I think today we're going to make a little bit of history in sitting in two houses on the same day. So I know that we have a fixture at 1.30 in the House of Representatives. In those um, few words and comments, Mr. Vice President, I therefore beg to move.